Hi, this is Tom Van Der Erk. I'm joined today with Sir Michael Barward. Welcome, Michael. Uh, 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 thank you very much, Tom. Thanks for the opportunity to talk to you. I'm really looking forward to what is a very, very important subject. We're talking about young people these days, and uh, Michael, you've written extensively about the changes in higher education. Uh, two years ago, you wrote a great report called uh, The Avalanche is Coming, and you said about young people that they'll need to be self-motivated, active agents, prepared to take responsibility for their own learning and, and skill development. That's an interesting statement and, and a much more active role than just deciding what college to go to. Yes. Um, I should attribute some of the thinking w w which we quote in our article is coming to Reid Hoffman and others who um, write about um, the um, seeing your own career as a startup. There's a book called The Startup of Me that Reid Hoffman and um, uh, Ben Casnaccio wrote, which we quote in an avalanche is coming. So I just want to make sure that I give due attribution to where uh, what prompted that theme in an avalanche is coming. But basically, I think this is a really important. I think in the 20th century, uh, and it was a major development in human uh, progress uh, in many ways. Uh, we built school systems, and the school system said we will educate you up to a certain level, and then for some there was a college system, we will educate you at a certain level, and then you joined an organization, maybe it was Ford Motor Company, for example, and at each stage of your development, there was an organization responsible for you. But what we're saying about the 21st century is that's no longer the case. Uh, clearly there are school systems, and many of them are doing a great job, but when you get to college, um, increasingly there's the possibility of doing stuff that you might assemble your degree from a range of different providers, not just from one college, right. um, and you need to think through uh, what, what you want to learn, but also uh, what you aspire to be and how to assemble that. And while you're at college, whereas in the 20th century, uh, certainly when I was at university, and maybe at you, Tom, as well, getting a good degree pretty much was a passport to a good job. Now, you go to most academic universities, they say you need to be volunteering, you need to be doing work in your summer vacation, you need to be building a range of skills, you need to be building the soft skills and all of that. So you have to assemble a package at a much higher standard than was expected 50 years ago. So unless you take responsibility, you're going to struggle with that. If you wait for the organization, uh, whether it's your school system, your college system, or you hope you're going to get an employer who will manage your career for a while, um, you might wait a long time. You need to take responsibility. You need to take the initiative. Um, and we can talk about how that would be brought about. But it, it strikes me that that even starts back in the middle grades and, or at least early in your high school career because there's so many options now, not only your own school but taking online classes and then informal learning and all of those set you up for a different post-secondary experience, so it really, I think, is more demanding on young people and their families. Yes, that's right, and and, um, and the sort of downside, I mean, obviously, there's massive opportunity in all of that. The downside right. is really, it's not at all obvious what you should do, and it's hard to get really good advice. Um, and secondly, you, this is not a downside, but it's part of the solution. Uh, right. Young people, if you talk to them, whether at school or at college, really want mentorship, so there's a lot of stuff you can do online but somebody more experienced who will provide mentorship guidance, not just on the way through a career, but on all the aspects of being a human being, the difficult challenges of relationship, right. all that. So I think mentorship is a really important part of education now in a way that we didn't quite see it like that in the past. Uh, I'm excited, as an aside, about virtual mentoring as part of the solution there. Um, it seems in the United States that, that starting about 15 years ago, um, in part because of work you and I were involved in, that, that the pendulum swung pretty hard towards uh, traditional higher education and away from uh, vocational and technical uh, training. And that the, the, we, we embraced this goal of all kids college ready, and that meant traditional college. But now we've seen this drop in the return on investment in traditional college uh, and more emphasis on, on technical training. Is that a positive trend? It could be, um, and I think potentially it is. And I think um, you know, there's, there's growing examples um, now of kind of six-week boot camps or right. you know, a code academy introduction to coding where you 
learn a very specific skill, master it, and then you can use it. Um, and those, I think those kinds of opportunity are becoming more plentiful and potentially a really, really helpful and practical and obviously not as expensive uh, as some of the college offerings. Um, the only thing to say, which is obvious but important, is if you do one or two of those things, don't think they'll last forever because the world is changing so fast, so you're going to need to keep doing that. Um, so, so I think we, we will see um, think things like... Um, is it, is it um, have I got the, the, the words right, General Assembly? Right. Yeah. They're, they're, they're putting on programs that will meet a diverse range of needs, but those things in, aren't... It's not in, like, in management design as well as technology. Yeah. Sort of the everything you need to learn to run a startup. The, one of the... Um, for in, in my co-authors on An Avalanche is Coming, Sarah Risley and Caitlin Donnelly, who I think at uh, different times you've met, we had a conversation after that about how it had been received, and we, we generally uh, think that, um, you know, we give aside one or two details, that basically we got the argument right. But in the intergenerational dialogue that I have with them, they're, they're um, just coming up to 30, I'm just coming up to 60. They were, well, one of them put it to me like this, um, which I thought was very, very striking. She said, Michael, when you left college, um, you... Uh, wanted to buy a house and you wanted to buy a car and in order to pay for those you rented out your labor to an organization. Right. We're going to rent a car, rent a house and we're going to own ourselves. Wow. That is a pretty powerful way of seeing the shift of the generations I think. It, it is and it, it uh, this sentence from Avalanche um, must have had their influence. They said um, Young people need to understand how to create value and receive value and act as an entrepreneur of their own career. Yeah, and, and again, that, that, that um, we attribute to, uh, to the, the, the Reid Hoffman, Ben Kasnotcha book called The Startup, yeah. the Startup of You. Um, and I, I think you, you made the, the very important point, Tom, that this goes back into middle school and high school. That idea that you have to take responsibility for managing your own career really needs to become part of the, the, the high school curriculum, certainly if not if not earlier in the school curriculum, because it's a very different thing from kind of marching through a set of stages and then getting a job with a large organization, which was the, the roughly speaking what the educated person in the 20th century expected. So this implies a career that's a combination of working for other people, working for yourself, but sort of owning the through line Yes. And that suggests a really different set of skills uh, uh, and a different mindset, uh, 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 much more initiative, yes. um, much more need to manage uh, short-term projects. What, uh, what, yes. else does, what else does that imply? Well, I think, I think you need, I think, I, I think you put it beautifully, so managing the through line you don't want to just get a sort of random set of experiences, so keeping an eye on how this is building up and what it looks like, and that's where I think mentor, mentorship comes in, and I agree with you that through sort of blended combinations or virtual mentorship, there's lots of ways of doing this. I think that is something that the higher education systems around the world really need to crack. Right. Uh, and then the other thing you can do increasingly, if, you, if you've got a, an idea of your through line and a coach or a mentor, you can also use virtual means to benchmark yourself against lots of other people, some of whom you'll never meet. So I give you an example from my own, uh, trivial in a way, but it helps make the point. So I'm, um, I'm trying to get fit through cycling, so I have a coach. I speak to him once a week on the telephone. About once a month, he and I go cycling together and he gives me some advice. Um, I have a computer on my bike that tells me how far I've cycled and how many uh, feet of ascent I've done. And on any given bit of road I cycle, I can benchmark my speed along that bit of road against thousands of people, none of whom I ever see because oh. I'm on the same website as they right. are. Um, so I'm getting coaching that is largely virtual but occasionally face-to-face, -face, so you could say blended, yeah. part of a benchmark group, even though most of those people I'll never meet. But it's a very powerful way of learning. Um, and I think you know people in there late teens and twenties, they will instinctively think like that. But, but it doesn't work. If, you, if you're too passive, right. if you don't take responsibility, then there are big risks in this. So in addition to this sort of quantified self and, and benchmarking, 
it strikes me that, that young people need to be more aware of brand management, of managing themselves as a brand and their, including their social, um, uh, you know, their, their uh, social profile. And, and secondly, uh, a portfolio, uh, artifacts uh, that, that provide evidence of uh, their knowledge, skills, and ability. Those things seem to be important as well. Yeah, and, and, and all um, assembled beautifully on LinkedIn or somewhere so that you can check them out. Right. Exactly. I mean, it's interesting that I, I, the use of the word brand, I, I don't think I'm revealing a, um, a secret here too, too badly, but in, the, um, in a Pearson meeting where we were evaluating some of the rising stars of the company, somebody said about one of the rising stars, well, um, she, she's doing brilliantly well, but she tends to manage her own brand uh, more than the Pearson brand. And then somebody else said, well, actually, isn't that what they all do? In the yeah. Time? And I think, actually, you have to do that. And the way, certainly the way I think about people is not that um, it's people who work for me in Pearson is not that they've come to work for Pearson, although they have, and some of them will stay. It's that they've come to work for Pearson because it's an opportunity for them to contribute to our mission and for them to learn something and right. uh, develop their career. And so it's a kind of negotiation between Pearson and them about, and, but I, I just use Pearson because I have to be here. I think this is true of the world over. You, you've got you, what people in their talented people in their twenties want is to learn, uh, to, to have some meaning in their work, that it makes a difference right. um, to work with, great people and so, so, so if they've got great people to work with they're learning something and they're making a difference obviously compensation and those things matter but those other three things are really powerful and, and a really a recognition that for a period of time you're coming together a coalescence of, of, of brands for a common purpose and that that may be a temporary agreement and that's just fine yes that's right and exactly and, and what Reed Hoffman says in the, in the uh, in a, a, another article that, that I read and has been influential um, for the way we think about it is um, if you employ somebody on that kind of temporary basis, although that may be two or three years, um, first of all, um, whereas demanding 100% loyalty might have been the traditional thing to do, actually allowing them to do other things outside the work they do for you as long as they're delivering for you is um, a net positive. Obviously, there's things about competitors you have to be careful about, but in general, and then when they leave, maintaining an alumni network. So all the people that have left my team in Pearson, we're still in touch with, we contact them, I go and right. see them, I'm traveling and I know where they're. So we, we, we're building a network of people who we know uh, had a positive experience at Pearson, which is good for Pearson, but also are positive about the educational change they can make in the world. And so they're a network of people to stay in touch with. And I think that's a different way of thinking from you get somebody who's loyal to the company and is right, and, and who will be there through their pension, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Michael Barber, we appreciate your insight and wisdom on this topic as always. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you, Tom. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity.